Hello, and welcome to the Nursing World Shared Practice Forum. My name is Dr. Sandy Mott. I am one of the nurse scientists in the cardiovascular critical care program. Today I have the privilege of talking with Harriet Nelson about the exciting and innovative program of research that she is doing. Harriet is a staff nurse, too, at Boston Children's Hospital and has been a member of the critical care transport team since 2005. I will never forget the afternoon several years ago when Harriet appeared and with great enthusiasm explained her passion to facilitate parents' requests at the end of their children's lives. She asked that we would help her make it become a reality. What is this passion that has been consuming your energy for the last few years? Hi, Sandy. My passion is in pediatric palliative transports, the transporting of children who are critically or terminally ill home from one of our ICUs for end of life and withdrawal of life support. Um, I was hired at Boston Children's in 2001 into the medical surgical intensive care unit. And it was there that I first started to take care of children at end of life. And I learned that not only did I take care of them, but I took care of their families. And when I joined the transport team in 2005, it was that bond that I missed. My two worlds collided in 2007 when I was asked to take a beautiful baby boy who was terminally ill from a brain tumor home. His parents wanted him to be extubated in his house surrounded by his family. So we did, we took him four hours north of Boston and he passed away in his mom's arms in a rocking chair in his living room surrounded by everybody who loved him. In 2010, I was able to do a similar transport and this was for a young boy who was 16 years old and had been diagnosed with an anaplastic astrocytoma. It was his mom's promise to him that if he worked hard, she would take him home. Unfortunately, his course was such that he had an acute light threatening event um, and he herniated. And, and when the conversation came up as to re withdrawing or removing life supporting measures, she said to the team that was caring for him that she wanted to take him home. She wanted to keep this promise to him, and we helped her facilitate that promise. So what did you learn from these experiences? What is so special about going home? I've learned a lot. Um, so I think from both the literature as well as from the families that I've taken care of, I've learned really five very important and special reasons um, to take children home at the end of life when they are critically and terminally ill warranting ICU level care. The first one is that it's an alternative end of life experience. It's something very different from the experience of being in a hospital in an intensive care unit. The second one is we've learned that it facilitates the grieving process for some families. Third, it provides parents with some control, control that they just don't feel that they have when they're inside a facility. Um, it also means that there's no hurry. Now, as a nurse in an ICU, and as a lot of people know, we say to parents after a child has died in our, one of our intensive care units that there's no hurry. Take your time. But what I've learned from parents, and I think that other people can agree with me, is that for some of them that they feel that this nurse could be you know, taking care of somebody else. This room could be used by somebody else. At home, that whole process is eliminated. There's no hurry. I can recall taking a child home and we um, extubated her in her room, in her bed, surrounded by her family. And I was standing in the kitchen and an aunt came out and said to me, now mom wants to know, when do we call the funeral home? And I turned to her and I said, whenever mom's ready, there's no hurry. Nobody else needed that room, that nurse, anything. They could take their time. The last reason is all about comfort. It's comfort for the family, it's comfort for the patient, it's comfortable surroundings. The word comfort just surrounds this topic in so many different levels. So those are the five reasons that I think are the ones that are most important that we've learned about you know, taking these patients home. Who is involved in making these palliative transports happen? We have three teams that facilitate these. Um, they are the patient's acute care team, so the bedside team, the team that um, knows this patient very, very well the pediatric advanced care team, or our PAC team, who does the palliative care um, aspect of the patient's care, and then my team. 
the critical care transport team. And we are the ones that really facilitate the trip home and are the ones that um, think about the logistics of how to get there, the safety of everybody on board, the ambulance, things like that. Um, so it really takes all three teams to make this successful. I'd like to turn now to our audience to ask our colleagues around the world a question. When you reply, could you please state your city and country location? The question is this. Do you have anything similar to this in your facility where you bring critically ill children home for their final days? What is the history of palliative transports at Boston Children's Hospital? So we have a database that um, houses all of the transports that we've done from Boston Children's. And the database that we have goes back to 2005. Um, I know from stories of team members that we've done a few prior to that, but since 2007, we've done now 13 of them. And every time I give a presentation on this, um, my graph gets just a little bit bigger. Um, if you can look at this graph and see that there are two patients in green, those are kind of the outliers, whereas they didn't come from an intensive care unit. They were two children that were on general wards that had um, medical circumstances that just made them a little bit too um, comprehensive to take home in a regular ambulance. So we did those. We also did um, the rest of the children out of our intensive care units, of which we have four. We have a neonatal intensive care unit, a cardiac intensive care unit, a medical surgical intensive care unit, and a medical intensive care unit. So as you can see from here, it's kind of a little bit of everybody. Um, what you can also see is that the majority of our patients have been um, intubated on mechanical ventilation, but it's not always the case. And what I've learned from the research is that um, most of the um, literature talks about children who are intubated and mechanically ventilated, but we are unique and we have different criteria that we consider life-sustaining measures. So we have two children here that were um, babies with congenital heart diseases. And in order for them to be alive, they had to stay on prostaglandins. Um, and so taking them home and discontinuing their prostaglandins was removing life support for them. Um, we also had children who were on uh, BiPAP or CPAP, so not necessarily intubated, but again, requiring positive pressure um, to be alive. And we were able to take them home and take them off their positive pressure. Um, which makes us just a little bit different from what we've learned in the literature. Now that you've explained the background, will you share with us what prompted your research study? Absolutely. So after the second transport that I was talking about, I was asked to present that case at Schwartz Rounds. And it was uh, just after that that I was talking with Dr. Rick Goldstein, who's one of the physicians on the PAC team. Um, and what we were talking about is, why don't we offer this to you know more families? And what we decided was because we don't know enough about it. And so we thought that the best way to advance this practice was to make sure that we were doing a good thing, that this had a positive impact on the um, families of the patients we had taken home. So we decided the best way to do that was to do um, a retrospective look at the parents and families we had already taken home and um, ask them a simple question. So as we were putting that together, I started thinking about, all right, well, how do I really make this happen? I haven't done a lot of research. Um, and so I asked my boss at the time, and she sent me to uh, Dr. Jean Connor, who is um, one of the nurse scientists at Boston Children's. And I can't Sandy how that's how I met you. <laughs> so um, I had the pleasure of becoming part of a nurse fellowship that the hospital offers. And um, Sandy was my nurse scientist mentor. And we worked together on um, this process. And what we did was um, we went to the families, and I personally went and interviewed each um, uh, family. Five of them participated in the study. And what I did is I just simply asked them to please share with me your perspectives about the experience of bringing your child home prior to his or her death. And this prompted a very big discussion in most cases from the parents. Um, I personally went and sat with five different families of children we had taken home, and I just said this to them and let them talk. And it was interesting because when we 
um, started to analyze the data, we realized that all of the parents talked on a timeline. And it really um, started with the decision-making process, whether it was their decision and they um, went to the care team and said, I would like to take my child home, or um, as we've done more of these transports, it became the PAC team or the bedside team that would approach the family and say, these are options for you. Mm -hmm. After the decision-making process was the transport. Some parents talked a lot about the transport, others really kind of glanced over the transport. Um, the next category that we saw was the homecoming. And it was interesting because some parents would talk about it as if it were a party or the celebration of a child's life, which to me was just amazing. You know, it really made me feel like this is positive. Um, then they talk about being home and the things that they would do at home, things like having dinner together for children who, you know, didn't die imminently or taking walks inside or outside the house, just things that they were able to do at home that you couldn't do inside an intensive care unit. The death of the child was really not spoken about a lot. It was kind of the before the death and then what happened after, but again, sort of glanced over by all of the um, parents. And then another topic that really rang out was life after and the memories that these parents have made since the death of their child and how being home really played a big part in that process. I'd like to turn now to our audience to ask our colleagues around the world a question. When you reply, could you please state your city and country location? The question is this, what are the options at your facility for parents when their child is near death? What are some examples of the uh, memory making after uh, the child dies? Um, so the one thing that I think um, I noticed in every house that I went to were the number of pictures of the um, children. Um, some of them were big posters, some of them were family portraits. Um, there uh, was a lot of talk about um, what parents do as far as keeping the child's memory alive annually. Um, for one little boy, they do a balloon release on his birthday and on his what they call angel versary, they um, light a whole bunch of those Chinese lanterns up into the sky. And um, they live in a very small community and they say it just stops traffic. And that is really what brings them peace each year at that time. Um, for one young boy, um, there's a website that has been dedicated to him and really is a place where friends and family can go to remember him and good times and what he brought to their life. So it's kind of like a blog that they have, which is um, very nice to go back to and read every now and then. Um, but every family has their way of keeping their child's memory very much alive. As with any research study, we start with looking at the literature, what's been published. What did you find? Um, I found a lot and a little bit all at the same time. I found that as far as pediatric palliative transports, um, they're common in the United Kingdom and that there is um, quite a bit published um, there. But as far as what's in the United States, we're limited to just a few case studies. There has been some literature published in the adult aspect of them, but really nothing as far as um, research in the pediatric realm. What changes have been made as a result of your study? We've had a few changes um, happen. Um, one thing that we really learned is that we had to come up with a systematic way of making these transports happen. Um, we had facilitated the first couple, you know, pretty seamlessly, but there was no system in place to make mm -hmm. them um, really seamless. So um, after the first few, we created this algorithm that you can see here. And what it did is it gave each team that is involved with this jobs to do. And once all of the jobs were accomplished, then the transport really happened seamlessly. We also created a checklist. So all of the transport calls that happen at Boston Children's go through our communication center. It's really the hub of all of the communication that happens between the three teams. 
and we thought that the best way to keep, um, again, organized with these transports was to have a checklist that the communication specialist would um, use in order to make sure that all of the boxes were checked and everything was done prior to the day of the transport. So these two things have made it so that everything really goes without a bump in the road, which was great. Um, one of the other things that we learned um, was that taking the bedside nurse home is really important. Mm -hmm. It's important for continuity of care for the parents. For the first few, I don't think we really thought about you know, introducing, especially the critical care transport team, because we are strangers to these parents. They know the bedside team. They know the pediatric advanced care team. But we were complete strangers, and here we are going to you know, take these people home. So we thought that the best thing to do was to take the bedside nurse home with us because mm -hmm. that person knew us. Mm -hmm. It would help us better understand the family and their needs and things like that. So that's something that we've really um, honed in on doing these last few, and it's been wonderful for the family. And the last thing that we've changed is we have a critical care transport team on um, staff 24-7. We do 12-hour shifts. But the goal of the transport team or their everyday job is to bring critically ill children into Boston Children's Hospital from referring hospitals around New England. Um, in order to facilitate these transports, we were able to say we'd make a dedicated team to do this. So what we do is we plan these transports one to three days in advance, and then we'll page out for a, a crew to come in just to do these so that, again, there's no hurry at home because we don't have to take that transport team and put them back in service to do what is considered their everyday job. I'd like to turn now to our audience to ask our colleagues around the world a question. When you reply, could you please state your city and country location? The question is this. Has anyone investigated the possibility of creating a program for instituting pediatric palliative transports at your hospital? I've been at many of your presentations, and I know when questions are asked from the audience, almost always the first question is, who pays for this? Correct. And I always um, have to answer the same way, that um, for all of the ones that we've done, the one thing I can say is the family never has to pay out of pocket for these. Whatever is not um, covered by insurance has been covered. Um, I am currently looking into... Um, hopefully with the dissemination of all of this information, uh, ways to find funding for these to um, better have, a again, a system in place for the payment of these unique special transports. That's very interesting. How has your research impacted practice at Boston Children's Hospital? It's impacted practice at both Boston Children's and really um, nationwide, I think. I have had the pleasure of talking about this um, research and the whole process at both local um, conferences as well as national conferences. And as far as impacting practice at the hospital, just increasing awareness mm -hmm. of the fact that we can do these, that we can have options for parents, you know, that are different from really what we've done in the past. Um, it has um, prompted more questions from the ICUs. I've been invited to several intensive care units to their um, uh, education days so that I can give more information and answer all their questions about, you know, who initiates these and how does the whole process work. And I think that by answering those questions, we've increased the number of children that we've offered this to. Along with doing poster and podium presentations um, to disseminate um, our work, We've also been published now in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management um, in the uh, September um, edition. So everybody can uh, take a look at um, our research. Um, that's all very exciting. And I guess there is some plans for the future to build on this work. Absolutely. Um, so right now we are in the process of doing a secondary data analysis um, where we really looked at two parts of that timeline that I was talking about earlier in depth. The two parts were being home and life after. Mm -hmm. So this secondary analysis really was to take a deep dive into those two particular parts of the um, initial study and to really look at what was so important to the parents about those two parts, about being home and about 
the memories and the life after the death of their child. So we are in the process now of finishing up that uh, analysis and creating that manuscript. So um, that is uh, hopefully in the near future. And then the other thing that we're diligently working on is creating a second study. So um, I think that it is safe to say that the bedside nurses really get to know patients the best. That we have physicians who rotate out in and out, whether it's weekly, monthly, however the rotation goes on that particular unit. But because we do family-centered care here at Boston Children's and because we work on nursing teams, the bedside nurses really get to know the parents well. So what we were um, thinking about doing and what I really um, am excited to do is to um, look at the nurse's perspective. So have a similar question to the ones that we asked the parents to go back retrospectively to the same patients that we talked about earlier and get the nurse's perspective on their thoughts, their thoughts you know, prior to the transport and their thoughts now. And now that we've done the research, what have they, you know, has it changed? Have they learned more? Is it more positive? I don't know, but I'm very excited to find out. So this will be ongoing in years to come. It will be, and I'm excited to see practice change. I'm excited to have learned that this is a positive thing, mm -hmm. that taking these children home has impacted families in such a good way, and to disseminate my information more and to really increase the number of parents who are at least given the option. Thank you very much for sharing this with us. I think we have all learned a lot. My pleasure to be here. Thank you.